Okay. Welcome to the last day of this week wow. for school. Yeah. For school, yes. Excited. Did everyone finish the lab? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. No. So, so we have a couple people who said no. Um, I, I, I got an email from somebody I don't know what time last night talking about their failed submission or incorrect submission or something like that. And I was not naming names. <laughs> so, so I decided I'll give you until sundown tonight to get it in and still call it on time. So those of you who had issues, you can resubmit. Remember, you just delete the first submission and make a new submission. So if you submitted something in a rush and it wasn't right and you know it's wrong, go ahead and correct it. Because I want people to have success, <laughs> not to be frustrated. If you, know, if you have questions, ask me about it. it. It actually should go pretty quickly once you understand, right? It took me, I kid you not, about 10 minutes to do the entire lab except for answering questions and you know doing the write-up part but that's because i knew how everything worked right so when, once you figure it out it goes quick um oh it seemed like i had some announcements i needed to make but i can't remember any so we'll just move on we last class period we did solving work energy problems your homework was work energy problems you now should be very used to you draw your diagram, identify if there is a non-conservative force, if there is, calculate the work non-conservative, determine, <laughs> determine what the initial potential energy and the initial kinetic energy is, remembering that you have to set your reference point, point for potential energy, except for there was one problem that told you which, what to use. Then calculate your final kinetic and potential, and then use the work energy relation to relate the beginning and ending conditions. So the reason it's generally easier than doing things with forces is number one, you don't have any directions involved. There, there is no directionality to energy, it's a scalar. That makes life easier. And then number two, because of that first aspect, the path that you use doesn't matter, only the starting and ending points. Today, we're going to look at power briefly and then get into momentum. So, oh, and I forgot, gravitational potential energy. Up to this point, we have been using one equation for gravitational potential energy, I think. That is potential energy due to gravity is equal to mg. We usually say mgh, but you might also say mgy. It's the force of gravity times the elevation. That is correct if G is constant, which basically means if you are at the surface of the Earth. But if you're moving somewhere significantly away from the surface now, if you're 100 feet off the surface of the Earth, not a big deal. You know, even at you know my house, 9,400 feet elevation, not significantly different still. But if you are in the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, then the acceleration of gravity is, I think, somewhere around 90% or 80%, somewhere in that ballpark, of what is on the surface of the Earth. So this wouldn't be right anymore. You're too, you know, you've changed the distance too much. That's because G, well, the force of gravity, depends on separation from the center. So in the same type, or in the same vein, if you're doing something like with planets orbiting other planets, clearly lowercase g, the acceleration of gravity we have on the surface of the Earth, is not going to be this right thing to use. So we on Monday or on Tuesday in the calculus class, we did this calculation. You have to use the definition that change in potential energy is equal to minus work and calculate the work for, um, for moving from one separation to another separation between two objects. And that gives you an equation that says the potential energy due to gravity in all cases can be given by this equation. And now I just said in all cases, and any reasonable, logical person is going to feel a little bit like, well, why did we learn MGH if this works in all cases? 
The reason is because with this equation here, your r is the distance from the center of the Earth, and it's a much more complicated calculation if you're only moving up and down 100 feet. But if you're moving a large distance, you have to use this. Notice it has a negative sign there. Potential energy is negative. It actually comes out of the calculus, but it's something very meaningful. As two masses get closer together, that is, as R gets smaller, what's happening to the potential energy according to that equation? It's getting larger in the negative direction, it's becoming more negative. So the potential energy is dropping. If there's no non-conservative forces, what does that mean about the kinetic energy? It's increasing. And so if something falls, it's increasing. And the closer you get together, the more they're going to be falling because of that 1 over R, the faster they're going to be falling because of that 1 over R <coughs> relationship. What happens if you get something infinitely far away? What happens to the potential energy? It goes to zero. I think you said non-existent, right? It goes to zero as R approaches infinity. So when things are really far apart, the potential energy is zero. So the potential energy is zero if they're far apart, and then it's more and more negative as they get closer together. This is actually significant when we talk about things like planets and orbiting. The total energy of, let's say, the moon orbiting the Earth. That's not a planet, but, you know. The moon orbiting the Earth is this potential energy minus gm1 m2 over r plus the kinetic energy 1 half mv squared. If that total energy is zero, the moon is free to go. But if that total energy is negative, the moon is stuck here. It can't leave. So it's bound if you have a negative energy. Now, of course, when I talk about the moon, it's really something that most of you, except for maybe Russell, haven't thought about much. But let's go to something that every one of you probably thought about. What happens if I give energy to an electron in an atom? It, goes into it can go into a different state, or if you give it enough energy, it what? It well, if, if it falls back down, I say if you give that electron enough energy, it doesn't just rise up to a higher level, what happens? It, it escapes. What's the condition for it to escape? It gets up to zero energy. The electrons, the force, the electric forces we'll learn at the very beginning of next semester, has the same equation for force as gravitational force. And thus, the electric potential energy has the same equation. And so you have a negative potential energy for that electron orbiting the nucleus, and you have a positive kinetic energy for it orbiting the nucleus. If you give it enough energy, so if total energy is zero, it's free to go. And so that's where the ionization energy is defined. When you get to a total energy of zero, then the electron's free. And that's why your energy levels are like minus 13.6 electron volts for the ground state of a hydrogen, electron in the ground state of a hydrogen atom. Negative because it's bound. Hopefully that rings bells or makes sense or something. Yes, that's right, Claudia. Power. Power is something that seems very trivial, but it turns out that students always forget what power is by the time we get to the second semester. So power is the rate at which energy is converted from one type to another. So the first equation I have there is work. Work is a conversion of energy. So work over time. Over time means it's a rate. So when I get my electric bill, we often call it a power bill, but it's really an energy bill. It's not a power bill, because power is the rate in which I'm using energy. What I care about for that bill is the total energy I use. Which what? Which, well, sadly, things aren't perfectly efficient. We're not going to get all the work out that we we're taking from energy. That's where the second version is, the delta E over delta T. That's universal. So what you have to do with that electric bill is you take the average power and multiply it by the time, or what they really do is they take the power in little, like, you know, one-second increments and multiply it by the time and add those all up. And that's how they get the energy they charge you for. 
But notice, since work was force dot distance, then I can take that definition of power and I have force dot delta x over delta t, but delta x over delta t is the velocity. So another equation for power is force dot velocity. What does the dot product mean? Parallel. Means we're multiplying only the parallel parts. And keep in mind, if I write this, that means force times speed. If I write this, that means the force times the parallel component of the velocity. They mean different things with and without the vector signs. So you, if you're sloppy and forget a vector sign, you're also wrong. Let's do a problem and then get on to momentum. So this is a realistic situation. I think this is uh, my former car, the specifications for the car I owned before my present car. So I have the mass of the car, 1492 kilograms, experiences a drag force. What is a drag force? <clears throat> yeah, it's the air resistance force. When you're driving the car, the air resistance is the major thing you're having to overcome. So we have a drag force there that's one half rho. Rho is the, that, that funny key looking thing is the Greek letter R, rho. And so rho is the density of the air, which I gave you there, 1.225 kilograms per meter cube. A, A is the cross-sectional area of the car. That's if you take a picture of the front silhouette, what you see there is the area A. So a car that has a big front silhouette, it's got to push more air, right? It's going to have more drag force. So you guys have seen Nathan's Corvette. Small cross-section, so it's going to have a much smaller um, drag force. Whereas you compare the stupid SUV I'm driving, much bigger drag force. And then we have the speed squared. So as you increase speed, the drag force raise, rises quite quickly. And I give you all of the parameters there, and then we say there is a rolling friction. Remember I talked about the rolling friction, that's like the tires flexing, losing some energy because of that, or some energy loss because of friction, the variance but I'll keep playing with that. And then I ask, what's the maximum cruise speed if it puts out a constant 182 horsepower? And at this point, what are y'all saying? Okay, that's what I thought. What is he talking about? We need a way to approach a problem like this. So what's the first step I usually do for a problem? Draw a picture. So I'm going to start with drawing a picture. Um, if it's units, it's watts. And I haven't defined watt. That's going to come along with the problem here. So, yeah, it's part of the confusion in units, I know. Because power has units of W. <laughs> so we have the car. The car is traveling with some forward speed V. And what forces are going to be acting on that car in the horizontal direction? I don't care at all about the vertical direction here, so I'm only going to look at horizontal direction. What forces do I have in the horizontal direction? The what? Okay, I have the drag air resistance, which is going to oppose the velocity force drag. Okay, I have the force of rolling friction. What direction is that going to be? Uh, also okay, also against the motion. The last one is the one that's the most confusing. Um, I'm only looking at the horizontal forces. I do, yes. Is that like the force of the engine? Well, you, it's not the force of the engine because that's not acting on the car. No, you're, you're not wrong here, Max. But it's the reaction force. right? So the engine is making the tires spin or rotate, and the ground is keeping the tire from, from slipping. So what do we call the force that keeps the tire from slipping? Friction. Friction. The force of static friction. So we have the forward force of static friction. That's what makes the car go. 
So there's our free body diagram. What do we know? Well, we know the force drag is one half rho A, C, D, V squared. And we're looking for V. So we know everything in there except for the V we're looking for. The force of rolling friction, we know that's 146 newtons. The force moving forward. Well, that's a little trickier. Is that? Well, what I have is just the power the car is generating. What is the power? That's 182 horsepower. <clears throat> and think of the last slide. The work done over time. Okay, the work done over time, which can also be written as? Force times the velocity parallel. Well, in this case, the force and velocity are parallel. So my <clears throat> my force static friction is equal to the power divided by the speed. And we know the power, that's 182 horsepower. In theory, what is a horsepower? Horse. It's the power that a horse can put out. It's how much work per second a horse can do. Okay, now that gets to questions that make it ridiculous. Right, because yes, different horses and different sizes horses and whatnot are gonna have different powers they can put out. So it's just like a standard for a plow horse, okay? Well, did they just measure a horse? Somebody did at some point in time. <laughs> because that used to be what they used for all their work. You know, you're you're plowing a field. One horse, two horse, three horse, four, you know. Depending on your plow, how deep it was going, how many you have, you need more horses, you need more horsepower. And if you watch home improvement, well, then you have good jokes to go with it. So what's the condition for the cruising speed? The acceleration is not only constant, it's zero because the velocity is constant. Yes, Oksana. So we have our condition since it's straightforward I didn't worry about vector signs. Obviously going in a circle you'd have an acceleration and thus I'm just going to use Newton's second law. Some of the forces in the x direction equals max equals zero. And so I have forward, the power divided by speed, backward, the force of rolling friction, the force of drag. And so now I need to solve this bad boy for speed. And so I'm putting in numbers here that are going to be problematic, to say the least. Times my area, which was 2.69 meters squared, times CD, which was 0 0.26 times V squared. So now I have V two places. Oh, no, it's a quarter. If we multiply all terms by V so we get out of the denominator, out of the denominator, we have the highest power is V cubed. So that's a quarter. That, that's a little less than fun to solve. We're not going to try to solve it here in class. Your calculators probably will solve a quartic problem. Um, they probably have a solver to do that. But there was another inherent problem that I said I was going to bring up. The units of power. Power is work per time, right? Energy per time. Unit of energy is joule. Unit of time is second. So the unit of power should be a joule per second. 
And so we define that one watt equals one joule per second. But then we have that ancient horsepower thing. And so we have one watt is one joule per second. One horsepower is 745.7 watts. And so we take that horsepower and we have to multiply it by 745.7 to get it into our standard units before we actually do a calculation. All of my other numbers in here were in SI units, but I need to have here my convert conversion factor. So if I remember right, obviously I didn't do the calculation right now. It comes out that it had a cruising speed of about 71 miles an hour um, based on those numbers. That's where the, the engine is putting out its maximum power output and it's virtually all being dissipated by air resistance. That rolling friction is a small, small fraction of the energy that's lost. Now with this said, let's say I want to improve the fuel economy of my car. What do I need to do to improve the fuel economy? What? Okay, lower its cross section. So we can get out the sledge and okay, we won't do that. If we could reduce its cross section, we would improve its fuel economy. What else can we do? Okay, she said she said decrease the mass, but mass was actually not part of that calculation. That, that affects how quickly you can accelerate, but not your top speed. Russell? Remove air from the planet. Okay, remove air from the planet. We're gonna have a hard time achieving that. But it would absolutely work. Our cars would get incredibly good fuel economy if we could do that. Actually, Okay, that was already brought up. Oh, that's that's correct. Yes, yes. Something, something we don't think about is this parameter C D right here which has to do with the air basically sticking to the car. If you do something to decrease that, you can get better fuel economy. What do they do with golf balls to decrease that? They put dimples because the dimples trap air on the surface and then you have air on air friction. And the air on air friction is much lower than the air on paint friction. So hail damage will improve. That's where I was angling for. Hail damage will improve the fuel economy of your car. Huh? Oh, probably not a huge amount, no. Washing your car will improve the fuel economy of your car by a very small amount. Like waxing your car. Yes, that would. <laughs> All right, so with that, since clearly Max is on board, momentum. I apparently deleted the M when I put the colon in there. Momentum. Let's see, who has momentum? Sarah. Sarah has momentum. <laughs> Why does Sarah have momentum? Because she's moving. She's moving. In, our, in our daily life, we like to use the term momentum. Like right now, we could say that the New England Patriots have a lot of momentum. What would that mean? They're winning a lot. They're winning a lot. They're hard to stop. We are losing a lot. They can't start. That's where I was going. I was wondering if the ball goes next. They they have a very negative momentum going on there. You you could also say no. They have absolutely no momentum because they are not moving forward. It depends on your perspective. Like down, so they have a negative momentum. <laughs> You know, I, I'm not even going to talk about the Huskers. <laughs> Russell. Um, well, as we'll learn there in the second semester with relativity, everything is relative. It depends on your reference frame what you get. We're doing everything right now in what we call the lab reference frame. Where do you think it's first station? Right? Uh, it's Clearly not. So, momentum is mass times velocity. 
which is why everybody said Sarah had momentum because she got up and moved at the time I asked the question. She had mass and she had velocity. Notice that it has a vector sign over the V, velocity with direction, not speed without direction. So that means momentum has direction as well. So you can have momentum going up and momentum going down. You can't have sideways momentum? Hmm? Well, yes, yes. I, I was thinking of the sports team, that's why I said up and down. But yes, you can also have sideways momentum. What is it good for? Newton's second law is actually defined by momentum. That equation, force net is equal to dp dt, that's calculus. That is the true form of Newton's second law. The sum of the forces is dp dt. Since we're not a calculus-based class for all the three of you, we go with the one that's to the right of that, delta p over delta t. The net force is the rate at which momentum is changing. And now somebody might say, well, why do you teach me MA? If the mass is constant, then those are equivalent. Because if the mass is constant, then delta P is mass times delta V. And so mass times delta V divided by delta T is just mass times acceleration. So net force equals MA is only true if mass is constant. Here is how you break it down. But if delta M over delta T is zero, then the last term is zero, and it's just what you've learned in class. So this is useful in things like, oh, I don't know, rocketry. Rockets, you change the momentum of stuff that you eject, and that's going to change the momentum of the remaining rocket. So let's look at simple problems. Momentum. Here I have a blue thing that has a mass of 500 kilograms, so clearly it's not a car. That's too little mass for a car. And it's going speed of five. <laughs> The what? <laughs> Clown car. Okay. And it has a speed of five meters per second going to the right. What is its momentum? Oh. Need one more piece to that. Okay, it's 500 kilograms times 5 meters per second in the x direction. And so the x direction is also an important part of that. For our purposes here for one dimensional motion, we'll do like we have done in the past and just use positive to mean to the right and negative to the left. Question, Mary. Anna. What does P stand for? Is that what P is the symbol for momentum. I don't even know why. You'd think I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why. I'm sure it's like a Latin word or something. So we have 2,500 kilogram meter per second. There's no abbreviation for the unit for momentum. It's kilogram meters per second. What about the yellow car? What's its in momentum beforehand? <laughs> I'm not going to write in yellow because we wouldn't read it anyway. So we have the two momenta, the two vehicles. If these two vehicles strike each other, which they will because the one behind is going faster than the one in front, and they stick together. If they stick together, then they're going to have the same final speed. This doesn't have that case. This has the front one, I was at first thinking it would, has the front one going four meters per second after the collision. So what's the final momentum for the yellow car after the collision? After 
Uh, actually, they're not. They, they, they collide. So what's the momentum of the yellow one here? Okay, 16. I, I heard six, and I was like, well, that's not right. Uh, nope. Too many zeros. Four hundred times four. I didn't write out the multiplication this time. Momentum conservation is an important thing that we use for these problems. Notice the second equation I have, which is Newton's second law solved for change in momentum. Change in momentum is the net force on my system multiplied by the time over which it acts. If neither of my cars break, then the net force of my system is going to be zero because I just have just have the force between the two cars. In a collision, we further say the collisions are so fast that delta T is approximately zero. So as a rule of thumb, during a collision, the net force multiplied by change in time, which we have a name for, we call it the impulse, is zero. Because the change in time for the collision itself is so short. And so momentum doesn't change. If it doesn't change, we call that conserved. So momentum is conserved in a collision if it occurs very quickly. Let's see the question. Does momentum need units? Yes, momentum needs units. Kilograms and meters per second. No, but I mean, does it have a combined unit? No, it does not. It doesn't have a special unit, which is, you know, sometimes a little annoying. So when you're doing a problem with collisions, you say, okay, momentum in the collision is conserved. So that means momentum initial is equal to momentum final. Momentum initial in this case was 2,500 kilogram meters per second plus 800 kilogram meters per second. And momentum final we have is 1,600 kilogram meters per second plus... We don't know the speed of the blue car, but we know its mass is 500 kilograms. And so here we have an equation where I put in the momenta that we calculated for each object before and after. And I only had one unknown, and so I can solve for it to find how fast the blue car would be moving after this collision. So... Just doing the work real quickly. So we have the blue one. No, 2,500 plus 800 minus 1,600 gives me 1,700. So 1,700 kilogram meters per second divided by 500 kilograms gives us 3.4 meters per second for the speed of the blue car after the collision. Now this is if they you know, bounce off of each other. We will, in the coming days, well, Monday, have some more that deals with this, but, but right now I want to do a, a problem, real life scenario. Back when I was in graduate school, my, my girlfriend and I went ice skating in Riverfront Park in Spokane. And as we're there, I was like, I am totally gonna show her how this conservation momentum works. And so I explained everything to her, you know, okay, so we're gonna stand like this and then I'm gonna push you and then we'll see how we move. And so the goal was to have it just like this. The big person, that's me, 80 kilograms, that's a dream. Um, the small person, that's her, 40 kilograms, yeah, that's about right. So we get there, and I push her, and what happens? She falls. She falls. How'd you all know this? I didn't, think, I didn't think that was going to happen. She falls, she cries, she gets angry, and I'm like, How hard was it's physics. What? How hard was it? It wasn't that hard. No, it wasn't that hard. 
<laughs> Don't speak ill of her. She's like, I don't know. What? What is it to the center of gravity? What? I tried to push out the center of gravity so that it would be forward and not making her go. And he, he has a very valid point. Yeah, okay, stand, stand up. I am going to demonstrate here with Sarah. If I push Sarah here, and she's on ice skates, she's <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah. Thanks for uh, asking. She's, she's likely to fall over because I have applied a torque about her center of mass, a word we'll learn later. If, on the other hand, I push her on her hips, she's much less likely to fall because I'm pushing close to the center of mass, making no torque, no rotation. So, like, why is that really complex? Like, it's like any question that it's falling. That, that's why Russell said the center of mass. You, you have to be realistic about where it is. But for most people, it's somewhere around the waist. Okay, so so she fell. It was terrible. You know what the worst thing about that day, though, was? No. The worst thing about that day was when I took my skate off, my sock was soaked in blood. And I was like, ah, I took my sock off. I had no wounds on my foot. No, disturbing. from whoever had had this skate before me, they didn't. Oh, I was like, how are you? Like, yeah. <laughs> that was the worst part of that day right there. That's a biohazard. Today's world, I'd sue them and could have put a check. It's not the way we live. Okay, so in this problem, it actually has all the numbers calculated for us. They started with no momentum because they, the child has half the mass of the person. They have to have equal momentum in opposite directions because they start with zero, they have to end with zero. And so the child is going to go twice the speed of the adult. And that's roughly what would have happened with Malco and I. I was obviously not as heavy then as I am now, but it didn't work out. No, even though I carefully explained. Okay, the term impulse. Some of us might have impulse control problems. What does that mean? <laughs> Chipotle at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Chipotle at 11 o'clock. That's an, an outcome of having impulse control problem. Impulse in, in our natural usage, it's like, oh, I feel like I should do this. I got it. I got a hankering to do this, impulse control problems. Yeah, I got a hankering, so I did it. You know, I, I went to Chipotle. Well, in physics, impulse is a very specific thing. Impulse is the net force acting on an object multiplied by the time over which it acts. And because of Newton's second law, it turns out that the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. I rarely use the word impulse just because I just prefer to say change in momentum. To me, it's simpler. I don't need that word. But it's an important thing. This picture is going along with another picture of a person hitting a tennis ball with a racket. When you hit that tennis ball with a racket, at the first moment of contact, the force between the ball and the racket is pretty small. But then the strings start to stretch, and the force goes up, and then the ball rebounds, the force goes back down. So the reality is that curve that looks kind of like a haystack. The force is constantly changing. If you do calculus, that'd be no problem. You get a function for that, you integrate it, you're done. But we don't have calculus, right? Oh, Randy says we do. So what we do for general physics is we say, okay, what was the average force during this interaction? It says here the effective force. The effective force here is the average force during the interaction. We take the average force multiplied by the time over which it acts. And that gives us the impulse. And then we can calculate how much the speed of that tennis ball is going to change because that impulse is equal to the change in momentum, the mass times the change in velocity. So, sorry. I know that wasn't a horrible sound, but it wasn't a great sound either. So this idea of Newton's second law and momentum helps us to understand how something like you know hitting a baseball with a bat is going to propel that ball. 
because we can calculate the change in momentum due to the collision. I don't think I have my, no, nope, don't have them, so I just won't do it today. I only have nine minutes left, so. When you're doing collision problems, which is what we're going to usually do with momentum, we're going to do collision problems. First thing you need to do is remember Newton's second law deals with a system. And that system is what you define it to be. So if I have a collision such as between two cars, that's what we do in almost all of our problems because, hey, it's easy to do. Then define your system as the two cars that are colliding. That way, the force between the cars, which obviously when one car hits another car, the force between cars is really large. That's an internal force. Internal force doesn't come into Newton's second law. So even before they're colliding, we're considering both cars this is weak. Yes, that's right. And so then you say, okay, now that I have my system, I look at the external forces. So the forces that are coming from outside of this box acting inside the box. If this car is braking, that would be an external force. If this car is accelerating, that would be an external force that's causing it to accelerate. The net force should be mass times acceleration, right? But then we have what we said about the collision. All the way up to the moment of the collision, we should use those laws. During the collision, because the change in momentum is the net force multiplied by the change in time, that change in time is so small, momentum will say is conserved during the collision. So you have two cars coming towards the tire, momentum not being conserved all this time. Then they hit crunch. Momentum is conserved during the crunch and then it's not conserved after. So if they stick together and they keep skidding, we have that skid no longer is momentum conserved during that part. Now this is something that is actually very useful. I'm sure some of you have been around after an accident and seen the cop out there with the little wheel measuring skid marks. When I used to, I was a volunteer firefighter when I was at PUC. And so, you know, we show up to the traffic scene and, or the, the crash site, and pretty much our job was usually just traffic control. That's what we did. But the cops come and they're carefully measuring the distances that each car skidded and whatnot because, well, if you know the rubber on the tire and the surface of the road, you can calculate the coefficient of friction. And knowing the masses, you can calculate how much energy was taken away by friction in the skidding. And then based on that, you can take from the end point to when the collision occurred and figure out how fast they were moving right after the collision. And then knowing how fast they're moving right after the collision, you can use conservation momentum to figure out how fast they're moving right before the collision. And then you measure the skid marks from there to see how fast they were going when they realized, uh-oh, something's wrong and they panicked. And so they do that to back out and determine how fast the cars were really going because you know what drivers are always gonna say? I, I was totally doing the speed limit there. I wasn't speeding, but they have the physics to allow them to make some pretty good calculations of how fast they were going. Center mass, as Russell brought out, this is where center mass occurs in our textbook. The center of mass can be thought of as the average position of the mass in an object. So Sarah mentioned some people have more upper body mass than others. So how do you calculate the center of mass? You say, okay, you've got the head. The head weighs this much, has this much mass. Because remember, mass is the weight divided by social gravity. And it's centered in the head right here. And then the arm, this part has this much mass with its center here. This has this. And you add all of those together and divide by the total mass. It's just doing a weighted average using mass as your weight to find the average position of the mass. Now, one of the cool things about the center of mass is in a collision, the center of mass is going to be affected. Well, in a, 
in an elastic place. So if you have a rocket, the rocket separates. The center of mass is going to stay on this nice shape trajectory, right? That's the word for it. And what's the shape of this trajectory called? A parabola. Unless you get really technical, then it's elliptical section because the Earth is a sphere, not flat Earth. Um, I, in graduate school, got really specific and said elliptical section, and my teacher marked me wrong. It's a parabola, you idiot. <laughs> I, I didn't have the courage to argue with him at that point. Um, so the center of mass will take this nice parabolic or ellipsoidal, um, elliptical, not ellipsoidal, that's three-dimensional, uh, trajectory. And so when they separate, these are going to separate, and the center of mass will stay on this, so this, you know, going like this away from the trajectory. And because the nose cone is going to be much less mass than the rocket, the nose cones could be going much farther forward than the rocket. So the center, the key here is the center of mass is what is going to follow the trajectory that we got from our kinematics. Um, <clears throat> practical applications, this is the last slide, by the way. Practi well, it's not the last slide in the PowerPoint, the last one I plan on presenting. Practical applications, this picture on the right is actually... I think it's from the court documents calculating what happened in a collision. So on the top you have the skid marks that are relevant for the accident. At the bottom you can see the measurements that they made on those skid marks to calculate exactly what happened in the accident. It would be kind of nice if you saw the cars and you know, had that aspect of it too, but we don't. Another aspect where this is used is things like in nuclear physics, you know, like the Large Hadron Collider, where they are looking at interactions between subatomic particles. And they use momentum calculations extensively in that case. So it is something that has a lot of utility. And we will study that more next week, including lab. Excuse me? No, we don't. I was wrong. It's the week after. I do have worksheets for chapters four and five, and I will get chapters six and seven done hopefully this weekend. And eight is the one we just started, I think.